From Olympic City and the home of Pikes Peak, this is the Automotive ADHD Show. And here we are rocking it on the Automotive ADHD Show. It's heard around the world as a podcast and in Southern Colorado on the radio, 91.7 KLZR, Voice of the Wet Mountain Valley. My name is Matt West. I am here. I'm here to talk cars, and I have a very special edition of the show today. Now, you don't want to miss a minute of this show. There are a lot of great places to check uh, check out this show. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it on Rumble, Facebook.com slash Automotive ADHD, and of course, right here as a podcast and on the radio. Now, I have a very special guest joining me on this edition of the show, so we're not going to waste a second getting to my guest. He hails from France. He's run the Pikes Peak Hill Climb five times. He is currently the pilot of the 2023 Radical SR Diesel with three turbos. Yeah, more on that. And he is the new record holder for the fastest diesel up the mountain. Some know him as the Diesel King. Gregoire Blasio, welcome to Automotive ADHD. Thank you. Hey, I am really glad to have you on here. I am so stoked. And first of all, congratulations on being the Diesel King of the mountain. Thanks. That's super awesome. Yeah, no, we're we're going to talk a little bit about your background. We're going to talk a little bit about the car, but but first, tell me how you're feeling coming off of that time, which by the way, 1025, the fastest diesel. How how has it been after race week here? Um just recovering, uh happily, super excited to cross the finish line. It was such a nice time. Um Yeah, it was it was just magic, you know. Crossing the finish line, I knew I knew I had it. Uh, so oh, that, that was great. You know, sometimes you have this little suspense where the other diesel are coming up the mountain, and you're like, "What if? What if he does a better time?" You know, the GTR was was uh, going after me, but no, uh, felt super amazing, and uh, yeah, just been enjoying my my win and. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. I mean, you deserve it. Absolutely. I mean, I know there's, you know, there's so much hard work that goes into that. And we're going to touch on a little bit of that, right? Uh, In in a little bit, at least. But um, what are you doing? Just out of curiosity, you're joining me right now from Wyoming. What are you doing to kind of de-stress after the after the big race? Uh, So essentially, uh, I jumped on in the van. So I have this Volkswagen bus, 1986 uh, Volkswagen Westphalia. Uh, that I love to travel into. So me, the wife, and the kids, we just jumped in the van and went from Colorado Springs to a uh, while on the way to uh, Yellowstone. Just just camping and enjoying sunsets, sunrise, you know, just relaxing and trying to do some fun stuff like hot springs, uh, just a little hikes and stuff like that. You know, it was, it's been super nice. <laughs> yeah, that's what that, uh, and you know that's what you got to do after such a hard week. You know, when when I've been talking to other drivers, when I've been talking to e- even other media and people too. I mean, it's a hard week up there on the mountain. You're you're you know sleeping only a few hours a night. You're working hard. You're working on the car. You're you know doing all this stuff. So it's always it's good at least to catch up on some rest. Now uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about your background. So you're from France. So from France to racing America's mountain, kind of fill in the details between that. How did that happen? Uh, so I guess I was doing this internship in in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, in the uh, Vanderbilt, uh, it's like a medical center. They also do university, uh, and they kept me for a job there. So essentially, I was in Nashville, sort of full time at this moment. And my buddy from France, Nico, wanted to do a a trip, and we we talked about, hey, let's go from Nashville to actually, it was also Yellowstone. Uh, in 2012. So I said, yeah, Nico, come over. I have this awesome car. I had Porsche Boxster S 2007, uh, midnight blue metallic, 10 interior sport package. Uh, I told him, just come over. We'll do a hell of a trip. 
So he flew from France to Nashville. We left, and on our way to out west, um, we stopped kind of randomly to Pike's Peak. You know, it was just like on the way, and it reminded us how much we loved the just the Ari Vatanen video. You know, the climb dance on YouTube. Just all this French domination from the eighties. We just you know started to look up at all those French records and. Peugeot Audi teams, you know, battling and stuff. And we were at the race. It was it happened to be race week. So <laughs> with a Porsche, we, we go up and down the Pikes Peak. You know, you can go up and down after 9 a.m. It's just open to the public, even during race week. Um, we go up and down and we're like, oh, man, it's so amazing. And then we see some teams, you know, packing up. And we see, like, the amazing teams, uh, like factory crazy operation it was sebastian Loeb back in the days was a peugeot team mm -hmm. it was like a team of maybe 30 people two people per wheel you know like engineers and stuff so so we see those people and also we saw we saw a few li little teams you know kind of like grassroots stuff and then we were like let's do this we can do it <laughs> so, so Nico and I in 2012 we were like let next year we'll be there and we did it uh bought a a Subaru JC8 Brighton so it was 1996 uh off Craigslist for like 800 bucks and I built it up it was like a Subaru diesel it was a Subaru diesel engine and cage you know safety I, I had the rule book printed and I was just I just did it. I think in 90 days is this very popular video on YouTube. I think it's called 90 Day to the Peak. And you see the whole time lapse of it. That's it. Wow. That's awesome. So, so you know, that's one of the things I love about Pikes Peak, which is that, you know, you I've talked about this on my show before, even actually. You know, one of my favorite things is how this is a race where you can be a grassroots racer. And you can go race on the world stage against factory teams. I mean, that <laughs> to me is nuts. It's, it's amazing. It's nuts. I mean, uh, like imagine doing that in F1 or something, right? You know, <laughs> it's bonkers when you think you're, about you're it. Right? Yeah. No. When you say it like this, I, I never really thought about it, but yeah, it's <laughs> it's pretty amazing. It's it's sort of. A, I mean, it, it's sort of a joke, but. After all, we did break a record, so. Oh, exactly. I mean, that's that's my point. That's my favorite thing about it. And, and, and I love that, too, because you can look at that mountain and go, man, I want to race that one day. And and then you did it and you set the diesel record. You didn't just race it. You broke records, which is incredible. Yeah, so it's it's so unreal. You know, I have to. I have to think about it more to process it. Yeah, um, and and I'm sure it hasn't even fully set in yet. You know, we're we're only <laughs> we're only a few weeks after the race now at, at this point, and you know, I'm, I'm sure it's not even set in yet. Yeah. Wow. Well, and, and so, and I got to ask about this now. All right. So, a little bit about you know, we we heard about your background, but tell me a little bit about the car because here in America, we only think of diesels as being in trucks and not race cars now i know you coming from europe uh diesel cars smaller cars not pickup trucks not commercial trucks are, are a lot more common than they are here but but tell me a little bit about the car and the three turbos i hear it has so let me start with the original car um uh, i was looking for this volkswagen bug it's like a, it's called a Fun Cup. It's just a tube chassis. It's actually a nice race car that's decorated with a, with a beetle shape, you know, just fiberglass uh, body. And I was looking for this like crazy for six months. Uh, and one night I see a photo of a, a, a printed magazine ad, just like a paper ad of, of this thing with a phone number I call. The guy, Jess Valentine, a well-known racer of Colorado Springs, really good guy with a bunch of Formula Vs and a uh, really good guy. He was just, this 
what I saw was a pre-published magazine ad. So nobody had this magazine. It was somebody that was so amazed by the ad itself, posted on Facebook from the paper, but it was not existing anywhere. Complicated, but anyway, I called the guy. He's like, yeah, I got the fun cup. It's available. I'm like, I'm leaving tonight. I tell, call Katie. I'm like, hey, I'm going to Colorado right now, you know. <laughs> the car was like, yeah, it was crazy. You know, my wife is used to this, you know, <laughs> okay. kind of like impulse craziness. Uh, go there, get this fun cup. And then it was my dream car. I wanted to put a TDI engine in a mid engine configuration. So this had the layout. Uh, it's actually using a Porsche five speed uh, transmission from the Boxster. And so the TDI bolts to that thing right away. Like there's no need of an adapter. It's surprisingly, you can buy a Boxster from 98, 99, 2003 and bolt a TDI engine to it. Um, so I, I did just that, put a TDI in there and went to Pikes Peak and that's where the package started. So this is the whole story is that we did, uh, triple turbo. No, so we did single turbo with five-speed manual in that bug. Then we went in 2022 compound turbo with PDK in that bug. And, and finally, we did tri triple turbo only one year in that bug and uh, triple turbo PDK. And then we took this transmission and engine package and put it in our Radical. So Radical is a, this uh, race car. It looks like a prototype. I mean, it is a prototype from the from from the UK, and the transfer was pretty well. Um, yeah, it worked out well. Where everything, like they mentioned, were fine uh, from the bug to the radical. So just a few cut, and I mean, actually a lot of welding and stuff, but it 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 fitted super well. Uh, so yeah, radical. So. It, 2000, what is the 2004 Radical SR3? Uh, the came with a Hayabusa engine. And uh, essentially, we just had to cut the whole rear end and re weld all those mounts and just make more room for the beefier package. Yeah, that's, that's wow. what it is. Uh, 1,600 pounds. Wow, 1,600. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is so well, cool. So the stock form is a Hayabusa engine and it weighs a thousand and fifty pounds. So we're he we're way heavier than the stock form. It's still super light. That's super light by uh, any measure, really. And and I guess this is just good info for anyone who has a has a radical, right? That you just just put the put the uh put a TDI swap in it with a PDK and go, I think uh I, I think more radical owners should do that a hundred percent. It's nuts. Yeah. I mean, I was inspired by this guy. Uh, I don't remember his name, but he had a Subaru swap in that radical. I was like, if he did that Subaru swap, like a, maybe an STI of some sort, uh, I can do my TDI swap. And it did. Yeah, it did work good. That's awesome. So, so tell me a little bit about the three turbos, right? I think as, as at least the enthusiasts, you know, not in the racing space, we're used to seeing a single turbo, sometimes a twin or sometimes a sequential turbo. H how does the three turbos, what is, what is that doing? What benefit is that? Uh, so essentially I like the, the, I like the entire lag aspect of it. Uh, by having three turbos, we can just always have boost. Uh, so that tiny turbo is so small. At idle, it makes 20 pounds of boost. At idle? So, wow. Yeah, I, just, the, <laughs> just the exhaust flowing in that tiny turbine make it spin so hard. It makes a ton of boost. Wow. Um, but, and, and I heard you're running 70 pounds of boost total. Right. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so this, the small turbo is only good to 45 pounds, but also it's so small. It can only create that boost up to 2,500 RPM. It's just a tiny turbo. Uh, just think about it this way. We're, we're 
you know, you have a tiny hose and you send a ton of water through it, you know, it will spray super far, right? Kind right. of like a kind of like a a water pressure machine, uh, a pressure washer, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so that tiny turbo has a lot of pressure, but low flow. Uh, the second turbo is, is just about twice as big as the little one and start to compound with the first one. So first one is, is pulling from uh from dead idle you get a good amount of boost out of it 45 pound it compounds with a second so those two are creating already like near 55 psi boost uh when the second hits uh it has a different function in the ecu but when the second hit uh target speed uh we open the wastegate and that diverts the flow to the third turbo. And, and by, by doing this, we, we ensure that the turbos are always pulling hard. Um, let's say I could decide to open the wastegate of my second turbo based on boost pressure. Uh, but th by, by doing this, you could potentially uh, have the turbo in a low speed, let's say, 120,000 RPM and the turbo is is now opening the wastegate right the second turbo is opening it because you reach a target boost uh, let's say you want four bars uh, if you if you do so you can lift the, the pedal like tackle a turn or two and you would go from 120,000 RPM to 90,000 RPM, that, that you get out of the, the boost zone of the turbo. So instead of doing this, I use a turbo speed sensor and I force the turbo to be in the high RPM zone. Um, it's maybe not the most efficient area of the turbo, but what it does is I am sure that when I lift the pedal and reapply, uh, I have this turbo is still spooling hard. It's just an anti-lag system. In some wow. Sort. Uh, okay. And, and, I, and I'm sure that's really important, you know, on a road where there's very little straight, you know, in the road itself, you're, you, you have some sections where you get a lot of speed. Obviously the picnic grounds is, is one of them. And that's where I was on race day as you and all these other drivers were flying past me. I was like, four or five feet from the road, which was, <laughs> which was a whole nother yeah. experience on its own. But, but, you know, you having that anti-lag and having that ability to know that you're staying in boost coming out of these corners. And, and I mean, there's so many corners. It's insane. Yeah. I mean, it, it's one of those things that it's a race like nothing else. And what fascinates me is seeing mm. the things that, you know, drivers mm. do different teams do like you with three turbos like you do you you try different setups and you find that's kind of the setup that's working really good and some of the solutions yeah. are really creative like that you know i i've hear i hear of lots of twin turbo setups you're the first time i've heard of a three turbo setup unless unless i'm just hiding under a rock and everyone's got three turbos but i don't think so no 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 it's extremely rare uh i have completely developed this thing like in my shop by myself like there no <clears throat> There was no one out there that was like, oh, here's the diagram and here's how you tune it. You know, no, we just went for it. We were like, we're going to do this and we're going to do dual compound. So we compound with a number one and number two up to 3000 RPM. And beyond that, we bypass the flow. The first one is absolutely useless. You know, after 3000 RPM, it's just too tiny. We just completely bypass it. And all the flow goes to number two and three that also compound. So uh you can see this way where the first compound session is like 55 pound of boost and the second compounding is like 70 uh number two and three are absolute monsters and and what i love is when i shift gear when i'm uh, hitting the rev not rev limiter i guess uh, and i and i upshift i still stay in the zone of the compound number two and three so it's like the high crazy boost so essentially when i look at my graphs uh my logs 
my my boost is a straight line. I have seventy like nonstop. From wow. like four, five, six, seven. It's just a straight line. It's crazy. It doesn't even drop. It doesn't drop like a, a half a second. It's just a straight line. And I'm like, hell yeah, I got all the boost in the world. All and the boost there. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing because i mean that's like that's like what people want you know people talk about well turbo's good but you know you got lag you got this there's all these different trade-offs no you you just have it all all the time you have all the good parts of it constantly yeah no no it's it's a dream setup uh we worked super hard to nail it and now it's done now uh, all only thing i need is like seat time because I only go in this car once a year. I only do Pike's Peak, you know. It's kind of crazy. Uh, so if I if I were to do like more races, have more seat time, know the car, improve a few handling things that I didn't like, um, man, I could easily be in the nine minute club. You know, I see that coming next year if it's dry. Uh, I'm I'm after it. So. Hey, that's awesome. I, and I, and I love that. And then that's like you say, if it's dry, if the conditions are good, that's one thing with Pike's peak. That's hard. I mean, you just, you never know. I mean, and, and plus it can be nice weather here in Colorado Springs. We're at the foot of the mountain, but you get up that mountain and you know, not this year, but the year before, I mean, the fog was terrible on race day. I mean, uh, it was cold. Yeah. You know, I was at devil's Fla- uh, playground, um, just freezing to death up there in freezing fog. And I mean, you just never know what to expect. So now, hey, don't go anywhere. My guest is Gregoire Blasso, and we are talking to the diesel king of the mountain. Now, we're going to be right back after this break. Every day, thousands go without the ability to buy necessary and life-saving parts. Parts like turbos, coilovers, and wheels. I'm Steve Turbocharged BRZ. It doesn't run because I can play with my connecting rod through the hole in my block. Project cars sit unfinished, waiting for parts, collecting dust. My name is Todd, and I bought a rotary. It's okay, bro, we'll uh, swap it. But no more. You, yes you, can make a difference. More information is available on the Automotive ADHD Facebook page. Facebook.com slash Automotive ADHD. Oh, man. And there we go. Those are car sounds from my guest, the Diesel King. He set a blistering time of 10 minutes, 25 seconds, and now holds the diesel record at Pikes Peak. And uh, I, I got I to gotta ask you, so we were talking a little bit about your, your setup on the car. We were talking a little bit about your background uh, in the last segment. But what are some, I, I'm curious, so with the, with the car, with it being a diesel, with it being three turbos, um, you know, you're... It's an interesting setup, and how does it differ, in your opinion, um, from some of the conventional gas race cars as well as now EVs uh, on the mountain? How you know, obviously, there's there's trade offs probably with every setup, but how does it feel to you compared to stuff like that? Uh, so at first, I I really was thinking that we would always be inferior, you know, like as diesel, it's like it's kind of a special group. You know, kind of hard to make a diesel perform super nice. So I always told myself, who can set the diesel record will probably be not competitive with the gasoline cars. But but that has changed, you know, over the years, pushing the boundaries of this engine, just like going hard on it. And well, now I... I'm threatening, you know, Randy Pops and his Tesla Plaid. Uh, <laughs> and like other, you know, Reese Millen with his like, crazy BMWs. And so things have changed. Uh, diesel is absolutely amazing up that mountain. I think it it's just full power all the time. It's, it's, uh, I mean, I, 
setting diesel record with something, you know, potentially setting podiums next year. I, I, I see that possible now. Uh, yeah, Abs- absolutely. And with the technology you've talked about with the turbos and things, I mean, you know, I, I think it's possible too to be talking about not just the diesel king of the mountain, but just king of the mountain, just yeah. the fastest, uh, regardless of the powertrain setup, you know? And, yeah. and I think, you know, a lot of the cars, you know, a lot of the hype right now is with, you know, the EVs and stuff up the mountain too. But, uh, you know, I think it, it will, and you look at, you know, Robin shoot this year. I mean, he, he still beat that time and not in, he, he was king of the mountain this year and not in an EV, you know? And I think it's just interesting seeing how different people develop these different platforms and they're all fast. They're all crazy fast. And again, here in the United States, again, we don't think of diesels as being fast. You know, I mean, we think exactly. of them as being torquey and peaky in the low end and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So Robin Schurt was, I was at his house and we we're watching all the onboard videos and everything. And he's like, dude, your car is ripping. It's so powerful. You know, how I want, I want to drive this thing. So uh, he's telling me that it's easily a nine minute club. So you just need to, you know, more seat time. Just just do more pack speak uh, training. Uh, it's just experience. It's just experience that has to build, be built over the, over the, over time. You know, you can't, you cannot just do pike speak at home. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and, and even too, you know, here uh living here at the foot of Pike's Peak, no one gets to race it until the race week happens, you know. It's not like living here gives you any advantage either. They don't let you race it, you know. So That's when you when you're talking about seat time, you know, you have you have race tracks, you have circuits as an option, but they're not they're not the same thing, are they? That has nothing to do with it. Wow. Yeah, it, you can't. It's so different. Yeah, you have this uh, called asphalt that you get nowhere else. Uh, the Yeah, the sunrise in your eyes, you just have the thin air, the, the breathing conditions. It's a whole compound of effects you have to put together and handle. It's kind of hard physically. But personally, never used uh, oxygen on board. Thought it was just too much hose and complication. I like simple, light, and uh, and it's fine. You know, I, I I didn't feel like I was losing control of the car because I was uh, lacking oxygen. So uh, this is this is one more thing. Oxygen is yeah very very thin up there. Oh yeah, and that 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 actually segues into kind of a question I was going to ask you anyway, which is what are some of the challenges that you face on the mountain obviously you know everyone knows about the the oxygen you know how tough tough that can be up there for the driver as well as the cars but what are some other challenges that you've run into racing it um i think it's it's mostly okay over those years i've got used to most of the little challenges you know like just being early and and so tired. I think this is number one. You know, that's a crazy one. That's specific to Pikes Peak because they only open the road from like five to eight. Um, yeah, I mean, number two, oxygen is is kind of okay. I mean, to to me personally, uh, I've been loving to do all this alpinism and climbing mountains and stuff. So I never felt really sick off of this. And then I guess the hardest thing is to be able to translate practice and race day. Like practice, it's earlier during the day. It's 5.15 a.m. sunrise to 8.15. And the asphalt is called, the light is different. And race day, you have this much harder asphalt. So you, you're like, oh, can I just send it? You know, it's like the sun is hitting the track. The asphalt is... 50 Fahrenheit instead of 32. Like, so that's the hardest thing for me is to be able to to compare and utilize my qualifying t- time and apply all the best on race day uh, without going too much. You know, you could you could be like, oh, asphalt is hot. Let me push it harder at picnic and, and go 150 instead of 140. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have a turn. You know, uh, so yeah, it's. I think it's, this is the hardest thing on 
and Pikes Peak. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's it's a super challenging race. And I, I see, I don't think anyone does it because it's easy. It's definitely not easy for sure. <laughs> but, um, you know, when you look at, like you said, too, with the asphalt, even on race day, um, I was talking to on, on this show, I had on this show uh, earlier, uh, Amir Bentatu. He's, uh, he's a race engineer. And he said, you know, on the show, he's like, you know, well, a race engineer, among many things, that guy's really busy. But um, he said, you know, he's like, man, I've never had to chase tire pressures so hard as I do here. You know, when you're talking about sure. your tire pressures, the temperatures, well, practice day, you ran this temperature because it was, you know, it was still almost, you know, sunrise outside versus race day. Are you seeing some of that challenge too, with things like that? Yeah. And there's also this thing is uh, during qualifying, you only do so much elevation gain uh, and so much, you build so much heat in the tire. And race day, all this amplifies by three, and I believe it's exponential. You know, uh, when the heat builds up, it creeps up like crazy. Uh, so your tire pressure end up building up different, you know, uh, this altitude, so they have atmospheric pressure that reduces. Uh, so tire pressure increase and everything. So yeah, all these little challenges. Yeah, they do. They do add up. Um, and, you know. it, and it's one of those things that, um, you know, I think if it were easy though, no one would want to do it. Maybe I think, I think it's those challenges that bring us to the race. Sometimes, you know, it makes that accomplishment. It makes getting that record too, you know, that much better because you overcame those challenges you 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 conquered them in many ways yeah yeah it feels good to to kill it it feels good <laughs> and, and you definitely did there now now before we wrap up just a couple more things um and and i always i i've asked a couple of drivers this too but um say you know next year or the year after that you you get king of the mountain right you're number one I, what would you do after that? Like, how would you move up from that? Do you have any ambitions that are, you know, greater and beyond that when it comes to racing? What do you think? Uh, I mean, I, I personally would like to make the car evolve unlimited, you know, just like I love technology. I love mechanics. Uh, I just, I just have to improve materials and, improve performance i think it doesn't have a an end you know uh so i will no matter what i just keep going back to my little shop and just crank up some new design uh involve some new you know advanced technologies into the design and you know and keep keep shaving seconds i'm sure you know maybe minutes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah well i mean when you think about it years ago too we weren't even talking about you know nine minutes or the eight minute club i mean we were like talking about let's break 10 minutes right yeah so you yeah. know that's that's what's crazy it's that progression it's that continual drive and progression to make it faster and faster and faster and that's and that's what i love about it and i love how you said that you're just gonna keep going back tinkering at it set another faster time. That is amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> passion first, you know, and this is my passion. Just love to do this. So I, I can't see myself stop doing this and go fishing. You know, I'm sorry for all the fishermen out there. But uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I do, I do love to go fishing, but I just cannot find the time anymore. You know, I have another passion that took over and, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's, I mean, it's good. It's good. You know, it's good. But you know, sometimes it's bad. You know, you, you, you sometimes at night, you you're looking at some design that cannot work. You know, you try to make stuff happen that that's not possible, mm. and you just waste time. <laughs> <laughs> that's all part of the process, though. That's you know, that's kind of part of it too. Um, yeah. So, uh, what, one more thing I gotta ask, and and I've asked this of every racing driver I've had uh, on the show. You know, tell me about the, the daily driver, right? We're talking about the race car. We're talking about the mountain. What, what is it that you get when you, you jump in the car to go get groceries? I know you were telling me about the seven passenger, the, uh, the mama mobile, as I've heard it called on social media. Tell me a little bit about that real quick. 
Uh, yeah, so I have the same engine in my race car as in my Volkswagen bus. You know, I just love the platform. It's just a strong engine. It's just so amazing. And yeah, does 32 miles per gallon. Uh, you can carry all the bikes and kids you want. Uh, yeah, it's just a great daily driver, you know, fire, fires up every, every morning and yeah, that's rear engine. So it has the vibe of the Porsche. Oh, okay. It handle, yeah. It's a handles really well. Uh, this, this particular seven passenger van has, so rear engine, a little bit low to the ground, uh, it's essentially a 911 with a little more passenger capacity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. awesome. Well, hey, not many people can fit seven people inside their 911. <laughs> so it's true. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, that's awesome. They, I mean, hey, actually, hey. Uh, Porsche made in, uh, in 1989, I think, they, they made a Porsche B32. You Google it. It's a Volkswagen van again, just the same as I'm sitting right now. And they, they did a Porsche transmission and a six cylinder air cooled. And they had like 12 of them. That wow. was pretty I, rad. I'm looking at them right now. That You, you got me one in one of these at least. That's for sure. <laughs> That is too cool. Oh man. Well, Hey, you know, and every, every racing driver needs a daily, right? And you need something that's cool. That's something that's reliable. Yeah. Hauls, hauls the family around too. Cause uh, I imagine yeah. you don't, you don't take the race car to get groceries every, you know, every day. Right. No, unfortunately. Yeah. I wish I wish. <laughs> that would be too cool. Well, Hey, follow him on social media on Instagram. He's at, uh, boxer underscore that's B O X E E R underscore. There's two E's in there. He's also on YouTube. You can see his amazing onboard footage from the fastest diesel run on the mountain. And I think it's really incredible. I really want to thank you as well for joining me right here on automotive ADHD. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.